I thought I might share with you all an anecdote or a humorous story that was developed by the Canadian populist and social organizer Tommy Douglas. Now, if there's any Canadians watching, they'll know who Tommy Douglas was. Tommy Douglas was the father of Canada's national health care system. He was a founder uh, of the National Democratic Party of Canada. He was a populist, a progressive, not a Marxist, not a communist, but a, but a progressive, a social democrat. And he would go around Canada speaking to labor unions, farmers associations, and he told this anecdote, which I think people might appreciate. This little story, I should say, not really an anecdote. It was kind of an, an allegory or a fable called Cats in Mouseland. He used to say that once upon a time, there was a far off land where almost everyone was a mouse, right? There were men mouse, women mice, uh, there were mice who drove cars, there were mice schools, there were mice hospitals, mice factories, mice farms. Everyone in mouse land, except for a few, was a mouse. But mouse land was ruled by cats. And every year, they would have an election in mouse land to determine which cat got to rule mouse land. And the people, or the mice of mice land, mouse land, were being told that this was democracy. Because every year they got to go to the polls and they got to vote for which cat got to rule over them. And it was a problem because, as you know, cats eat mice. And a lot of times the laws were written in ways to enable the cats to eat mice. They would have rules about how big the holes were that these little mice could crawl into. They would have rules of, about how fast the mice could run away when being chased by a cat. And so they would have an election. And many of the mice who were upset, they would say, you know what, we are tired of this administration. We have had a black cat running the country for years. Things just get worse, we keep getting eaten. So this year, we're gonna vote for a white cat. And so they voted out the black cat, and they voted in a white cat. And they would have debates in these upcoming elections. And the white cats would say, well, we think the mice should hide in uh, uh, holes that are square. And the black cats would say, no, uh, we think that the mice should hide in squares that are round. And every year, the mice were told that it was a democracy because they got to go to the polls and vote for which cat got to rule over them and which cat got to make the laws that resulted in them being eaten. But according to Tommy Douglas, as he told this lovely anecdote, once upon a time, there was a little mouse who had the brilliant idea to come forward and say, wait a second, maybe the problem in mouse land Maybe the problem isn't that we have a white cat or a black cat. Maybe the problem isn't that our mouse holes are round instead of square or square instead of round. Maybe the problem is that this is a country made up of mice, but yet we have a government of cats. And perhaps if we wanted to be really democratic, and really enact the popular will, we should have a government made up of mice that would serve the mice of mouse land. So immediately, this little mouse was put in jail because he was a Bolshevik agitator. He was a communist. The end. I like this story. I think it's a beautiful story. I think Tommy Douglas, you know, and it's little anecdotes like that. That, that made the socialist movement great. When I first got involved with one of the leftist groups I was involved with, uh, there was an older woman uh, who had grown up. She'd been a child in the 1930s, and she had many of these little witticisms, many of these little allegories for explaining socialist ideas. You know, um, and, and it was kind of the beauty. That was the beauty of socialism. It wasn't, you know, thousand-page books on surplus value. It was this kind of popular wisdom 
that worker, working people are being exploited. The banks, factories, and industries ought to operate for, for serving the people, not serving the rich. Um, it, was, it was kind of beautiful. So with that in mind, as people are continuing to pile in, I see there's a good crowd of people. Some of you are already here. I thought I might read you from this book, Why Communism, by Moisha Olgan. And it has one of the most beautiful, most clear and precise essays I've ever heard arguing for communism. It's the first chapter of, of a 1932 pamphlet from the Communist Party, USA. This is how Moisha Olgan, a leader of the Communist Party, USA, in 1932, this is how he presented the party program. He said, quote, this is, this is the essay. You are a worker. You had a job for a number of years. Your pay was not high, but you managed to get along. You were a faithful worker. You never shirked. Perhaps you saved up a few dollars against a rainy day. Perhaps you were married and raised a family. You were decent and law-abiding. But one nice morning, you were told that your services are no longer needed. In plain words, you were fired. You were thrown out. There is a depression, they say. The employer is no, has no more work for you. He cuts operations or he shuts his plant altogether. While you remain without a livelihood, he goes to his country estate or abroad to have a good time. He does not care to think what will happen to you. You plainly do not exist for the company any longer. It has no obligation toward its unemployed. And yet, come to think of it, you are not a stranger to this factory or mill or shop. You and the like of you have built it. You and the like of you have created all the machinery, all the raw material and all the fuel which is necessary to run an industry. You and the like of you are the live power that puts motion into the dead matter of every industrial undertaking. It is your blood, your sweat, your muscle, your brain that is sunk into every piece of goods produced. You have much at stake in this establishment your whole life. If labor means anything, this place is yours more than it is the owner's. It's part of your very self. Suppose now that you are told to go. You refuse to budge. Suppose many of you get together and say you're not going to stay where you belong and continue working because this is the only source of your livelihood. Suppose you say you are going to produce for the benefit of yourself and others. This thought may be strange to you, yet consider what would happen. The owner who has never worked and who does not know how to work would call the police. Most probably the riot squad would appear. Perhaps the militia would be called out. There'd be clubs, clubs and riot guns and tear gas galore. You would be clubbed and shot at, and many of you imprisoned, tried, and convicted for the sole crime of wanting to continue working at the machines and with the materials that the like of you have produced. Has it ever occurred to you that such a state of affairs is wrong? Take another example. You're a tenant. For 10 or 15 or 20 years, you've been living in a house. You have paid your rent regularly. You have paid off your flat several times over. Your landlord smiled at you as long as you were a good tenant. But now that you have lost your job, you have not paid your rent for several months. A sheriff comes. Your furniture is thrown out into the sidewalk. You are evicted. Yet you know perfectly well that it isn't the landlord who built the house. It is you and others like you who produced all the building material and actually constructed the house. Besides, you, the landlord, you made the landlord rich because of your payments. Suppose now you refuse to quit the house. Suppose you band together with your fellow tenants and declare you are not going to permit anybody to drive you out of the house. You are a proud American. You will not allow any man to turn you into a beggar. Again, you would be confronted with police clubs, courts, and jail. It looks strange, but this is the madness of the everyday practice of our great and wealthy country. Now, there are some notions that have been made clear before we proceed. We've said that the owner has never worked. Now, you might disagree with that statement. Doesn't a factory owner spend days and days in his office? Doesn't a banker keep, keep uh, office hours? Doesn't he go to the country club and golf links to rest after strenuous labors? 
The papers and the preachers and the professors tell you that the businessman is doing his share in production. They tell you that he is an indispensable part of the industrial organism. This is one of those incorrect notions that has been inculcated into the minds of our people from childhood on. In fact, the small businessman may still do some work for himself. The grocer works behind the counter. The cobbler works together with a few of his men. But the bigger the business, the less work remains for the actual owner. What does Morgan know about the operation of railroads and mines and restaurants? What does Rockefeller know about work in a coal mine or an oil refining plant? Remove Ford from the top of his pyramid and nobody will notice the loss. Ford may have been instrumental in working up his business long ago with the aid of numerous engineers and workers, but he no more runs his business than the man in the moon. Big business, large-scale production of the modern type is conducted by all kinds of specialists with the aid and cooperation of the workers, engineers, technicians, draftsmen, machinists, and chemists. All kinds of experts are managing the big industrial giants of today, and these are hired people while the board of directors and the other big shots of the corporation only decide upon policies which reduce themselves mainly to manipulating stocks. These people never produce. They could be removed without any loss to the actual operations. And yet it is they who decide to cut down production or to close the plant altogether, depriving the staffs of specialists and skilled and unskilled workers of the sole means to make a living. Those who do not produce decide for those who produce. As the bankers and brokers, real estate operators and promoters, they do not produce anything essential to human life either, and they have a lion's share of control over production. As a matter of fact, they produce nothing. They transfer paper from hand to hand. They, the, that paper, call it checks and deeds or drafts or shares, is a claim to the fruits of someone else's labor. Another is the question of bad luck. You've been taught to think that you are out of work. It's, it's just your misfortune. Business is bad. There's a depression, they say. Nobody is to blame. You are given to understand that economic powers are beyond your control, beyond human control. You are told that a depression is something like an earthquake, like a thunderstorm, like an avalanche. And yet, human ingenuity has learned how to control some of the most ferocious, formidable, formidable forces in nature. The human mind has harnessed electricity which produces lightning. Human knowledge is accomplishing things which look miraculous. The tropics and the poles, the airs and the bowels of the earth are coming under the control of man. Why should he not be able to control the production and distribution of goods that are vital for his life? Isn't the Soviet Union a living example that this can be achieved? Why shouldn't there be a situation like the one we su why should there be a situation like the one we suffer in? In the United States, where at present millions of able-bodied workers, capable and willing to work, are being consumed, consumed by idleness and hunger, while excellent machines and mountains of raw materials are laying around unused. Is it so difficult, after all, for human genius to organize a constant flow of goods which would satisfy everybody's need, with nobody compelled to go without food, clothing, and shelter? Humanity has learned to master the forces of nature, the progress of science is tremendous. At this, uh, and it goes on to talk about a display. We cannot blame the plight of millions on natural forces. There is nothing natural in this situation. It is not natural that men should go hungry while the means of production that produce food are close by at hand. It is not natural that a government should order the destruction of three and a half bales of cotton by plowing under the year's harvest on tens of millions of acres in the South, the way it's done by the government of the USA in 1933. While there are so many badly dressed, it is not natural that there should be poverty in the midst of plenty. It is not natural that milk should be dumped into rivers while babies starve. It is not natural that the most ingenious means of production and transportation should be rusting away while those who produce them and can operate them are wasted away by starvation and disease. All of this is most unnatural. It is insane. And one word about the law. You've been taught to respect the law, which appears in the shape of the policeman and the judge. You were taught that this is justice. Yet where is the justice of your being thrown out into the street for non-payment of rent? 
Where is the justice of you being dismissed from the mines after years of work? When the owner ejects you forcibly from his premises, this is not called force. When you resist, they say you are using force and violence. When the sheriff puts your belongings on the street, that's the law. But when you break the padlock and replace your furniture in its old place, that's unlawful. Why is it that violence against the worker is the law, but resistance to this violence is unlawful? Why is it that robbing you of your only source of life is justice, but protesting against this bloody injustice is, is injustice? Something is wrong here, too. Apparently, all these notions about law and order, about justice and injustice, about crime and punishment, are made in the interest not of you and those like you, but in the interest of those who use them against you. One more instance. Say the workers declare a strike. They've been told many times by the fine gentleman that there is a partnership between the owners and the workers and that they must cooperate for the benefit of the industry. When partners disagree on a certain issue, they fight out their dispute. Suppose you decide to fight it out by refusing to go to work. You are entitled to do so under the law. You organize a picket line. You say you are partners in this plant and you want to fight it out with your employers. The employers try to bring in scabs. You refuse to admit those scabs. Immediately the police arrive. The law protects the scabs and attacks the strikers. If you insist on your right to keep the plant shut, you are fired at. And the history of strikes in America is a long trail of bloody murders perpetrated by the police, by the law protecting the scabs. There must be something wrong in a law that professes equality of employer and employee, but at the same time uses that power to oppress the latter in favor of the former. There must be a monstrous lie in the statement that the employer and the employee are partners to the business and equal before the state. The capitalist state itself is something vicious and cruel and not nice and lovely institution of liberty like it is reputed to be. We think it is more urgent for workers to look more deeply into these matters. Moreover, it is our deep conviction that workers who do not concern themselves with these vital problems are doing a grave harm to themselves and their class. Only when you understand the malady can you find the proper cure. And that is from Why Communism? Plain Talk About Vital Problems. Uh, by Moisha Olgan, 1933. We need more of that folky, down-to-earth, clearly understood language explaining socialism and class struggle. Beautiful stuff. Cats and Mouse Land is how I started out. Then I read you, Moisha Olgan. Folks, I'm glad you're all with me here. Be sure to hit the like button. The more likes we get, the more the algorithms love us, the more people are watching. Be sure to subscribe. If you have not already subscribed, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Um, be sure to hit the notifications bell. I know most of you are probably here because you got a notification. And, uh, also, um, we'll get going here. 